Hey there, this is Ryan on episode 20 of No Code, No Problem. Today's episode is brought to you by Adalo. Adalo is a powerful no-code tool that you can use to build mobile and web apps in minutes. I featured Adalo on episode two before they were a sponsor, and I really recommend that you check them out at adalo.com. I'll have the link in the description. So for today's episode, I'm here with Matthew Heger, who is the co-founder and CEO of Clutch. Clutch allows you to create production-ready design systems, applications, and websites that connect to any backend with your team in real time. So say hello, Matthew. Hello, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so do you do you want me to call you Matthew or Matt, or do you have a preference? Call me, yeah, either, either is fine. All right, so um, I think we're gonna start today's episode off by kind of going into your background, so how you got here, why no code, and then what we can get into uh, more about Clutch and and the things that you're doing there. Great, sounds good. So yeah, so let's hear a little bit more about yourself, um, like your background, and then why you chose No Code. Yeah, so I've uh, I actually started uh, programming when I was about eight years old. I was playing a uh, video game called Duke Nukem. Um, probably should have been playing that at eight years old, but they didn't know back then that video games could be hazardous to your health. And, um, I really wanted to, um, figure out how to create my own levels and Duke Nukem was great. And the fact that it shipped with its own programming and level builder actually named build and just out of sheer willpower taught myself how to, how to use it. And, um, so I've been really obsessed with programming and coding and building things ever since. And, uh, by the time I was 19, um, you know, I, I dropped out of high school and I started a, um, a web development agency or product agency. Um, I ended up uh, building that agency up over about 12 years to a team of about 50 people. And we just would, you know, crank out all sorts of digital products, websites, apps, and so on. And I realized that a large part of the production process was very disconnected from the strategic problem solvers in the team. Um, a lot of these problem solvers are going to be your, um, your UX, your people who are coming in and sort of like collecting user stories and figuring out um, the problems that we're trying to solve and that kind of thing. And so um, they would, they would be the ones sort of coming up with what the problem is designing the solution. But then it was sort of like a black box. It would sort of flip it over to the developers and pray that a, that they designed all the possible states that are required in order to solve a problem. And that B, the developer would sort of produce it correctly. And, uh, even if they were all in the same room together, there seemed to be a lot of disconnect to this problem. And so I became really interested in figuring out a way to make products or building products more directly accessible to those strategists and designers. Um, and that's what really got me started on building clutch. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. So how long would you say you've been working on, you know, solving this problem? I've been working on solving the problem probably since the very early days or very early years of poetic. So probably back in uh, 2008, 2009, the first few attempts at it were, would have been monolithic front end and back end, um, things that I built in Ruby on rails. Mm -hmm. that sort of allowed people to build their own websites. But as things started moving more towards um, where you have a separate front end from back end, um, you know, started rethinking all of that. And I've tried many things, um, various different um, products that kind of sort of like be a drag and drop front end builder and then build like command line tools to ingest those and build products. But none of them seem to have a good enough user experience to actually be usable by these designer slash strategists. So it seemed like the um, only way to solve that would be to build it all into one tool. And I would say that we started on that in late 2016. So it's been three to three and a half years that I've been working uh, specifically on this incarnation, which we call Clutch. Awesome, yeah, so so yeah, so it's Clutch now. So real quick, what, why this change in name? So it was Shift Studio and now it's Clutch. Is there any like good reasoning behind that or? Yeah. So when we brought our uh, COO on, 
she kind of said, there's too many things named shift. And there wasn't when we started back in 2016, you know, but like between 2016 and now there's been a few more companies sort of pop up with the name shift. So we decided to um, look for a new name and I had a whole bunch of domain names that I already owned. And uh, being from from Houston, which uh, has the nickname Clutch City, I owned Clutch.io just as a fun domain name that I might do something with one day. And whenever I told them, hey, I own Clutch.io, which is nice and short, everybody loved the name. And there's some interesting things about the name Clutch beyond it meaning like something that's really legit right in the time that you need it is kind of the definition of that word. Um, it, it also is the name of what happens when you collect, uh, whenever you connect, uh, two Lego pieces together. So I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Yeah. Okay. Like, that's... like Lego, Legos has, has clutch powers. Have you ever heard of that? I've not. No. Yeah. He's like one of their action heroes, clutch powers. I have, I have a bunch of, uh, I have a few kids at home, you know, so I play with Lego still and, um, yeah. the clutch power is actually the patented technology that holds two Lego pieces together. So we also thought it had a fun meaning as you think about, um, as you think about the name and as we're taking web components and sort of connecting them together. No, that's really cool. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of meaning behind that, which is ironic because it was just an extra domain you had. <laughs> yeah. Serendipitous. Yeah. Right. So, um, so you've, ha you've changed the name and, you are currently, you let in, was it 300 people, was it, to test it out? I forget what um, she had said. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've we been, like, slowly trickling people in, but, um, you know, we used it ourselves to build things for over a year now. Yeah. And then very recently, we've, we've let maybe 30, 40 people in, but it's been 30, one at a time, very, very slowly. You know, we're, we're not trying to massively get a whole bunch of users because our thinking behind this is if the first 30 to 40 people aren't happy with the product, we don't need, you know, 400 to, to sort of contend with. So we're going to get this initial 30 to 40 people really happy and then we'll let in maybe 100 and then we'll let in like 500 and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's that's good strategy. That's what she said. You have quite a quite a long wait list. So. <laughs> yeah we do um, but uh yeah okay so i guess a question that i have for you is why so I, we covered the why you started it and it, i guess the the why you started it and why you kind of got into no code or or one in the same um but what do you think is the future then of your product, I guess, not, not necessarily no code, but just your product in general, like where do you see yourself in five years with clutch? Well, so I think the problem that, that we are particularly solving might be a little bit different than most no code tools. We're not necessarily trying to make it to where people don't have to learn any code in order to build things. Mm -hmm. Instead, what we're really aiming to do is align professionals with their target platform. So to kind of reel that back and, and kind of go through that, we believe that all of these tools that exist, all these pixel based or even vector graphic based editing software, they were built for the print world where you have a canvas that's a fixed size, like a sheet of paper, uh, or you build these artboard that are all fixed sizes. And then you draw graphics that are laid out by X, Y coordinates onto this um, sheet of paper this digital sheet of paper. Um, that's not how products work, but we're using tools that were built on print principles to try to design products. Products have state and they have, they're four dimensional, not three dimensional. They're four dimensional in that as you do things, what you're looking at actually changes and morphs. Whether you fill out a form and then you click submit and then there's an error state and you need the buttons to check turn red or uh, some screen transition to happen. And, and these design tools just aren't built for that. So we believe that a whole new set of professional tooling needs to come out where the design tool is built against the expectations of the target platform. You should not be, for example, today in a design tool, if you want to design a button, you'll design eight copies of it. And you'll just say, this is primary, this is secondary, this is warning, this is error. 
And then a developer, whenever they go build a button later on, is going to build one version, uh, but with a variant that flags all the different um, variations. Design tools should do that in the first place. So we're, we're a part of a group, I believe, that's bringing in and ushering in a new sort of era, era of design tooling that is no longer based on print principles, but that is based on screen design and application principles. And then over the course of the next um, five years, I think we're going to see a lot of people adopt these new tools. It's going to be a hard change because it actually requires more effort on the part of the designer. I mean, today the designer just drags things wherever they want and they don't worry about the downstream impact that, that, that happens to the developer. All that stuff's going to sort of move upstream and they're going to start having to build responsive buttons and buttons that are accessible. They're going to have to start thinking through all that extra stuff. And then over the ne next five years, I think that people are going to start to think it's ridiculous. They're going to look back and think that's ridiculous that we ever didn't do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, got, it's like thinking about the early days of sort of like, you know, web programming and explaining, you know, how things used to be to people when they think that it's ridiculous compared to the way that things are today. I think it's going to be similar. Um, one example I have that I tell people is like, would you ever open an SVG file and edit it by hand? And everybody says no. Mm -hmm. um, but an SVG file is just a bunch of uh, tags no different than HTML. Why do we think it's okay that you look at a visual image that a designer gives you and it's totally acceptable today to go hand code all that stuff? Yeah. So in five years, we're going to look back and think that th that we were ever building interfaces non-visually, we're going to look back and think that was ridiculous. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, it's true. I mean, it's definitely, we've come a long way and I think there's still a long way to go for sure. Um, so you said, you'd mentioned that you, you know, you're, you're in this group of, I guess, companies you could say that are doing this. So do you have, so is there anyone else doing I guess what you're doing in the no code space and specific to like, you know, like what you guys are doing. Sure. I think that, um, Webflow probably led the, led the charge towards, um, real product that can be produced by a uh, professional designer. And so I think that you're really going to see like three layers of tooling. You're going to see no code tools like Wix and Squarespace that are meant for the non-professional to build something that they need that looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. And those tools are typically template based, like choose from a template and I'll fill in your content and then hit publish. And then you're going to see um, like this middle tier, um, which I think Webflow is in bubble maybe is in that category, though I might consider bubble to be in the, in the first category, but for people who want to build apps, but there's going to be this whole mid-tier uh, no-code section of tools. And these are more highly customizable than the first tier. And they're more prosumer. Like you're going to have to be a little bit more proficient and technically capable to use this set of tools. But they have their limits as well. Like you'll eventually hit a wall with these and you can't get past that wall. And then the third tier of tooling I don't think exists right now. And that's the tier that we're going into. And that's the high end professional level, sort of like low code, no code tier. Um, that's the, that's where clutch enters. Um, I think that the last time that this existed was back with flash and they also had a product called flex and flash and flex were used in the enterprise and they were used to build sort of like high end applications in a very low code slash no code way. Mm -hmm. But ever since flash died, I, you know, well, you know, there's another company out there called QT that exists that's common in the Linux and embedded computing space. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can drag and drop and build interfaces uh, that can be exported to the web and to apps. But one area that I think is important to look is in the gaming industry. And in the gaming industry, you have things like unity and we don't have a tool like unity in the web and app space. And that's really our mission. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. So, um, in terms of, so in talking about like the low code, no code kind of thing, do you think that a tool can be both or do you think they're, 
different or what, what's your opinion on